if you're listening to this, uh, you're probably as fascinated by AI as I am, and especially these ultra large language models we keep hearing about. Yeah. I mean, composing symphonies, mm. writing code, the possibilities seem endless. It's pretty mind blowing what they can do. But, you know, let's be real for a sec. There's this big elephant in the room when we talk about these incredible feats, right? The cost. Yeah, the cost. And I don't just mean the initial price tag of building these things. I mean. Right. It goes way beyond that. It's the ongoing cost of actually running these models that people often overlook. So explain that a little bit, like what goes into keeping these models up and running? Well, think of it this way. Every time you use AI, whether it's a search engine or a chatbot, every single interaction requires a ton of computing power. Oh. Pretty. And that's what we call inference. And it can get really, really expensive. So it's like building the model is just the first step. Like you build this powerful engine, You'd like but it. then every time you want it to do something, you're basically paying a hefty fuel bill. That's a great analogy. So as these models get more complex and more people are using them, what does that mean in terms of like the overall cost? Well, we're facing this uh, kind of resource explosion, the demand for processing power, especially these specialized chips called GPUs. Yeah, I heard of those. Skyrockets, and that translates to a mountain of costs. It's a huge roadblock on the path to making AI truly sustainable and accessible for everyone. So it's not just a question of building these amazing models. It's about making sure we can actually afford to run them. Exactly. Which brings us to, I guess, optimization. Absolutely. So what are some of the ways researchers are trying to make these models more efficient? Well, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. One big breakthrough came from a company called Moonshot AI. They developed this thing called the Muon Optimizer. The Muon Optimizer. Okay. And it's been shown to actually double the training speed for large language models compared to, you know, the traditional methods. Oh, doubling the speed. That's got to have a huge impact. It's massive. Faster training means significantly lower costs, which could speed up research, make AI development more accessible to smaller players, and even open up completely new applications that were just too expensive before. So it's not just about saving money. It's about like unlocking entirely new possibilities. Exactly. So besides optimizing the training, are there any other ways to tackle these costs? Oh, yeah, definitely. Researchers are also focusing on making the models themselves more efficient. And there are some really fascinating techniques being developed. One is called sparse training. It's like teaching the model to... Um, selectively focus on the most important information. Okay. So it's ignoring the less important data. So almost like teaching it to be more discerning, to cut through the noise. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. And then there's another one called flash attention. It's a way to speed up how a model processes information so it makes inference much faster and cheaper. So how does that work? Flash attention. Well, imagine uh, you're searching for a specific piece of information in a huge library. Okay. Instead of looking through every book page by page, Flash attention lets the model quickly scan and find the relevant sections. So it's all about working smarter, not harder, right? Precisely. So even with all these advancements in optimization, are we talking about a fundamental shift in how AI research is actually done? I think it's becoming clear that the old way of doing things, like closed and competitive research, just isn't going to cut it anymore. We need to be more collaborative. And that's where the idea of open labs comes in. Open labs, okay. Basically, imagine a research environment where experts from all over the world can come together, share their findings, their code, their successes and failures. That's the core of an open lab. So it's like moving away from that traditional secrecy in AI research. Right. And what would be the advantages of something like that? Well, one big one is that it allows for continuous improvement of the models. Multiple teams can work together, find and implement optimizations much faster, and keep those models at the cutting edge. So instead of each team working in isolation, it's more like a constant exchange of ideas, a global brain trust for AI. Exactly. And what about those cost-saving techniques we were talking about, like the efficient transformers, LoRa'i, quantization? Right. In an open lab, researchers can openly share their experiments with those techniques, which speeds up progress and avoids wasted effort. It sounds like open labs could be a game changer, not just for efficiency and accessibility, but for the entire research landscape. It really could. But how do we get from this vision to reality? What needs to happen to make open labs the standard for AI development? Well, it's a pretty big cultural shift. Yeah. yeah, it's a big one. It means moving from competition to collaboration. And how do we convince researchers, you know, in these big organizations to actually embrace that? to give up that competitive edge. 
It's a good question. I think more and more people, especially, you know, younger researchers are realizing that the old way just isn't sustainable. Yeah. They see the limitations of closed research, you know, all the wasted resources, duplicated effort. Open labs really offer a more efficient and ultimately, I think, more productive way forward. It reminds me of like the open source movement in software. Yeah. Once people started sharing their code and working together, mm. innovation just exploded. Mm -hmm. Could we see the same thing happen with AI? Absolutely. We're already starting to see signs of that. There are a bunch of open source AI projects that are gaining a lot of traction. Okay. And, you know, organizations like OpenAI are really pushing for more collaborative research. It's a pretty exciting time to be in this field. It definitely sounds promising. But let's play devil's advocate for a minute. Mm -hmm. Are there any potential downsides to this whole open lab thing? Like, what are some of the risks we need to think about? Well, one concern is the potential for misuse, right? Yeah. I mean, these are powerful technologies. Right. If we make them more accessible, we also have to make sure they're used responsibly and ethically. That's a good point. It's like giving everyone access to a powerful tool, but no safety instructions. Exactly. So we need to develop really clear guidelines, ethical frameworks for developing and using AI. Yeah. And those frameworks need to be built into open labs from the ground up. Makes sense. Are there any other potential challenges? Another risk is that research efforts could become fragmented. Mm. If everyone's working on their own little piece of the puzzle, we could end up with a lot of duplicated effort and no clear direction. Yeah, like a thousand architects trying to build a house, each with their own vision. It could get pretty chaotic. Exactly. So strong leadership and coordination are going to be really important within open labs. Yeah. We need well-defined goals, clear priorities to make sure everyone's working together toward a common objective. So it's not just about opening the doors and hoping for the best. It takes careful planning and execution to make open labs work. Absolutely. But despite those challenges, it sounds like you're optimistic about the potential of this collaborative approach. I am. I really am. I think the benefits of open labs far outweigh the risks. We have a huge opportunity here to create a more collaborative, sustainable, and equitable future for AI development. That's great to hear. Yeah. And it's exciting to witness this shift toward more openness and collaboration in the field. Yeah, it really is. So moving on from the research side of things, let's talk about the impact that Open Labs could have on society as a whole. Okay, yeah. I mean, imagine making these powerful AI tools accessible to everyone and affordable. Right. It could revolutionize so many fields. Healthcare, education, scientific research. Definitely. Even environmental conservation. It's really about opening up a whole new world of possibilities, not just for solving problems, but for empowering people to come up with new solutions, new innovations we haven't even thought of yet. Yeah, exactly. It's about democratizing access to AI, making sure everyone has a seat at the table. Right. And that's what I find so exciting about this. It's not just about incremental improvements. It's a fundamental change in how we approach AI development and its role in society. I completely agree. So to recap what we've covered so far, we started by talking about the elephant in the room, mm. the massive cost of these ultra large AI models, both the training and the ongoing cost of running them, that inference cost. Right. And how that's only going to get bigger as the models become more complex. But then we talked about the incredible progress being made in model optimization. Yeah. Things like the muon optimizer doubling the training speed. And techniques like sparse training and flash attention that can help bring down those costs without sacrificing performance. And then we dove into this fascinating concept of open labs. Collaborative research environments where experts from around the world can pool their resources and tackle these challenges together. And hopefully make AI technology more accessible and equitable for everyone. It really feels like we're at a turning point in AI development. And the path we choose now will have a huge impact on the future. I think so, too. It's an exciting time to be a part of this field. So as we move into the final part of our deep dive, I want to leave you with this thought. If open labs do become the standard model for AI research, what impact could that have on the development and accessibility of these technologies? Hmm, that's a good question. Could it lead to a more inclusive AI landscape where the benefits are shared by everyone? It's certainly a possibility worth exploring. Yeah, it really feels like we're standing at the edge of, like, a whole new world with AI. And honestly, it's kind of uh, a little intimidating. It is a powerful technology with a lot of potential to change our lives. And we need to be really careful about how we use it. For sure. We've talked about all these amazing advancements and, you know, the cost, accessibility, the open labs idea. Yeah. But there's this uh, 
other big piece we haven't really touched on. The human side of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, how do we make sure that AI is serving humanity and not the other way around? That's a really big question. And a lot of people are thinking about that right now. Researchers, policymakers, ethicists. One important aspect is something called human-centered AI design. Okay. So it's about designing these systems to align with human values, yeah. to help us, not replace us, yeah. and make sure we're still in control, making informed decisions. So it's about AI as a tool that we use, not something that controls us. Exactly. And that requires, uh, I think, a shift in how we all think about it, not just the people developing it, but society as a whole. So we need to be more conscious, more deliberate about how AI fits into our lives. Yeah. And start thinking critically about what role we want it to play, how we can guide its development to make sure it's a positive force. That sounds like a big challenge. Where do we even begin with something like that? Well, education is a big part of it. Yeah. We need to demystify AI, make it more understandable for everyone, and encourage people to talk about it, you know, the good and the bad, okay. so that we can all make informed decisions about how we want to live with it. It's about giving people the knowledge and understanding to be a part of the conversation, to shape the future of AI. Exactly. And it's not just about educating the public. It's also about training the next generation of you know, AI developers to think about the ethical implications of their work. So they're not just building cool technology. They're thinking about the impact it will have. Right. We need them to understand that they have a responsibility to create AI that benefits everyone. It's exciting to imagine what AI could do if we approach it with that kind of awareness. I mean, imagine AI helping us solve climate change or curing diseases, ending poverty. Yeah. And at the same time, helping us live more fulfilling lives. That's a future worth working towards. But the thing oh. take more than just the technology itself, right? It takes a change in how we think. Yeah, definitely. We need to understand that AI isn't just another tool. It's a force that's going to shape the future of humanity. So as we wrap up this deep dive, let's take a minute to remember what we've talked about. We started with the incredible power of AI, but also the big costs involved. Right. We talked about the open lives idea, making AI research more collaborative and accessible and the importance of optimization, making those models more efficient and affordable. And we can't forget the human side of it. Yeah, human-centered design, mm -hmm. ethical frameworks, and making sure everyone has a voice in the conversation about AI. It's clear that AI is going to change our world in huge ways, but the ultimate impact, that comes down to the choices we make today. As we finish up, I want to leave you with one last question to think about. What role do you want AI to play in your life and in the future of humanity? It's a big question, but the answer is going to shape the world we all live in.